Um, I've been reading the book actually. Uh, John Hughes on Life in Film by Kurt Honeycutt. Have you? Oh yes, yes. Yeah. I'm. Yeah, that's. Um, uh, did that? That didn't come out over here, did it? Did you have to get it from the states? No, I'm, I found it on Amazon. It was about thirteen pounds oh, really? on Amazon. Yeah. Oh, okay, right. Yeah. No, that's. I mean, when I wrote the the stuff that I wrote there, I used that, and there's one called "You Couldn't Ignore Me If You Tried," which is very good, mm. um, which came out in the states. Um, but there weren't that many books about him. There was sort of, there's quite a lot of like 80s retro stuff that's quite fluffy. Yeah. Um, but nothing that really got in depth. But but that book and the other one, you couldn't ignore them if you tried, but like finally someone's really going into detail about these things. Yeah, because I must admit, like usually I'll have a scan around Wikipedia for little bits of information and there's more yeah. in the book on his, than on his Wikipedia page. His Wikipedia page yeah, is yeah. really thin. That's that's really good. But Kirk, he's I can't remember who he writes for. Is it Rolling Stone or Vanity Fair or something? But like a big right. American magazine. So he's okay. very respected. You know, he's like he's like the real deal. He's sort yeah. of like the Kerr mode of uh, of America. Right. <laughs> <laughs> There's a thought. Oh, I. <laughs> oh, I don't, I don't know if you um, do you listen to Kerr Mode's podcast? I know you you drop in yeah. every now and again. But yeah, 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 yeah. Because yeah. uh, we actually, we got a little bit of a mention towards the beginning of this academic year. Because um, I set it as a homework for one of the first lessons, I think. Just go and listen to it for my year 10s. And the yeah. student stopped me in the corridor and he just said, I can't stop listening to it now and it's your fault. And I tweeted <laughs> about it and then it just went from there. So we ended up being on the yeah. podcast a little bit. Yeah, so that was good. Oh, that's good. Yeah, yeah. that's excellent. Uh, okay, so... Um, from again from reading the book, uh, so John Hughes started out by writing jokes for Rod and Dangerfield and John Rivers. Yeah. Um, he then went to start writing essays and stories for National Lampoon. His yep. first credited screenplay was Na- National Lampoon's Class Reunion. Yeah. Uh, Class Reunion was panned, but subsequently found success with the screenplays for Vacation and Mr. Mom, which yep. earned a three picture deal at Universal Pictures. Yep. Yeah. Um, according to Spy Magazine, execs at Universal were unimpressed with a rough cut of The Breakfast Club and forced Hughes to finish editing the film in LA, which broke his deal to work in Chicago. So yep. he then sued them, got out of the picture deal, moved to Paramount, but then went back and forth between Paramount and Universal before finding his place yep. in Fox towards the end of his career. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he essentially garnered a reputation as someone, being someone difficult to talk to which is a little bit weird given the kind of sentimentality of his films. Um, and he became a bit of a recluse with Sooner Stay in Chicago. Um, I mean, I was just, because a lot of the, I will get into this a little bit later on, but I, I've come to John Hughes quite late. Um, right. A lot of my friends, a lot of the people of the same age were essentially brought up with him and brought up with his films. I think I first watched Breakfast Club probably five years ago. Um, yep. So I, I feel like I'm quite late to the party with it. But I was surprised at how much he churned out in terms of yep. scripts and just directing the films because there's a good, I think it's, we're almost on one a year when we start looking yeah. at the films that he directed. Yeah, um, totally, yeah. And, and I, think I'm, that, I'm, I think that really affected him because he was sort of a workaholic and would write all night, you know, um, chain smoking, you know, yeah. <laughs> to sort of get spew out these ideas because he was so... Um, so full of of stories and just mm. like these all night sessions just churning out idea after idea after idea and which was great you know it's great for us as as film fans but i think that meant that he sort of retired earlier than uh, someone who would be perhaps a bit more measured with how much they <laughs> they churned out because yeah. it burnt him out you know it, it, success burnt him out and that's when like you said he sort of became slightly more reclusive and it became took more of a back seat in in production and writing rather than be, being the sort of the figurehead like he mm. was when he was directing stuff. Yeah, because I mean, I introduced him earlier in the podcast as an '80s and a '90s director, and I thought, is that really giving him the credit? But it's literally just that time period. Yeah, um, yeah, I, not not even the whole decades, is it either? It's sort of mid '80s to mid '90s. Yeah, one of the questions that I thought about asking you was like, are you familiar with any other directors that do the same? But then I had a look at. Um, Woody Allen, and he's done yeah. a film a year since you know yeah, the eighties, yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
because it was it was just strange to me because like I'm a, I'm a fan of like Christopher Nolan and things like that, so I'm used to waiting yeah. three years for these yeah. films to come out. Um, and then obviously, you know, there's the idea that it's everything that he does is biographical or autobiographical. There's a truth in everything that he's put on yeah. screen and things like that. Um, yeah. So before we really get into his work, um, I just wanted to know what your first experience of John Hughes was or is. Um, I think my first experience was Ferris Bueller's Day Off, yeah, um, which remains my favourite of all of his films. And I, I think actually the, I think it's the one that's aged the best, but I also think it's the one that even back in the 80s was, you know, pristine, was sort of untouchable. Um, and uh, I remember watching it on a day off. How wonderful was that? That I, I was having a day off. Admittedly, it was, it was a day off school because I was ill. I wasn't just bunking. But even so, there felt like there was some kind of kismet, you know, in the air. Something like this had to be because I was on a day off from school watching a film about a kid taking a day off from school. So I was watching it on VHS, which is what my folks used to do, you know, when I was a kid and I was ill off school because they were both working. They just my dad would just go down early to the video shop at 9am, rent me a couple of movies, thinking, well, he can, this will just sort of entertain him for the day. Yeah. Um, you know, which is great parenting, as far as I'm concerned. I'm very pleased he did that. Um, and one of those films was Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Good. Uh, I think mine, just trying to go back as far as I could remember, is probably Home Alone. But oh, yeah. just recognising the name John Hughes and then kind of picking up on it and it being around... Yeah. Um, and then even through, as I'd seen later things about Ferris and about Breakfast Club, because um, I, when I was at university, so this is going back a couple of years now, probably about eight years, um, in the final year, we did a film show on the radio station, on the student radio station. Yeah. And I was talking to a good friend, Marty, about John Hughes. And I just had to back off from that conversation because at that point, I'd not seen Breakfast Club, I'd not seen Ferris. Yeah. And I, he, you know, he loves it. And he was, he was all over that. So yeah. again, it was something... I was raised on Disney and the kind of films are like the Disney Renaissance yeah. in the nineties and stuff. Oh yeah. So it was yeah. like, this is definitely something that I need to catch up on. Um, and there's, even, there's a real difference as well between, um, between the nineties John Hughes of home alone fame. And, and he did some other movies that were sort of other little kids in wacky situations <laughs> films. There's one called baby, baby say out. Um, there's a real difference between that John Hughes, you know, and if you grew up with that John Hughes, you think, well, he makes films for kids. He makes mm. kind of slapstick movies for kids. Um, and, you know, it was such a shift compared to what he'd become famous for in the 80s. Yeah. Um, so what I thought we'd do is we'll start off with some of his work as just a writer or like solely kind of yeah. writer credit. Um, yeah. But I'll be honest, I think I'm relying on you for most of this. Um, because my uh, you're a foolish man <laughs> yeah <laughs> my uh my watch through was kind of just the films that he directed um so as a writer uh, we've already mentioned mr mom and national lampoon's vacation um yeah. which i read that chevy chase is based on john hughes's dad right okay um have you seen either of those Yes, yeah. I mean, both yeah. of those films, um, if you want me just to carry on now, are you happy with just... That, yeah, just yeah. <laughs> go for it, yeah. Yeah, I mean, both of those films are very much about families. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's something that always interested him, even in his later teen movies and his sort of kids' movies towards the end of his career. Families, of course, are still very much at the heart of it. But in Mr. Mom and... and uh, vacation, you know, they really are about families, a family on holiday or a family dealing with this idea that the dad would have to stay at home yeah. and the mum would go out to work, which was a real sort of radical idea in the early 80s. Um, so that, I, I, I think, comes from his own background um, and especially because he became a family man very young um, you know, John Hughes's teenage years are sort of something that everyone's focused on because he makes teen movies. So we all thought, oh, let's investigate him in the 60s when he was a teenager mm -hmm. and into the Beatles and a bit of hippie and all this kind of stuff, which was all true. But then actually he married young, um, had kids quite young, had a sort of office job quite young, I mean, early 20s. And so suddenly this guy who was sort of rock and roller, you know, 60s beatnik, becomes Mr. Sort of Sensible with a sensible yeah. job in advertising and a sensible life. And I think that 
that um, fascinated him actually for the rest of his career. That idea of what it means to be a dad and what it means to be a family man and to have that kind of traditional family unit. And um, it, it's, it's genius when you think about it because families, you know, everyone has a family of some sort. And we've all sat down at a table with families and argued and, you know, uh, laughed and cried and all those dramas and, and funny things that, that, that come out of the family unit, uh, whether that's sort of a traditional family unit or a more broken family unit or a more updated family unit. You know, there's so much stuff that can come out of that. And he really mined that, I think. Um, but specifically with Vacation and Mr. Mom, which were solely about the modern 1980s family. And I think even more focused on the modern 1980s dad and what he represented. Yeah. And actually what he represented in both of those films was someone who just didn't really know what was going on. <laughs> you know, I think, I think so much had sort of occurred in the 80s. There'd been so much change politically and technologically socially all these kind of things and you look at both Michael Keaton and Chevy Chase in those movies and they're just that sort of one step out of touch with it all you know mm -hmm. they just can't quite get a grip on what's going on right that's interesting actually um and then he went on and did European Vacation uh, and then in 1986 wrote Pretty in Pink um this is one that I caught up with I watched it on Sunday um my instant reaction was why didn't he direct this one um is eight yeah, the I same year as Ferris? Was, yeah. yeah, yeah. It was just it was just purely because he was too busy, you know. By yeah. that point, he was really it, he churned out all these these scripts and just couldn't do two things at once, mm. and so got a protege, Howard Deutsch, to direct it for him whilst he was doing other things. Um, and I think that you know I love that film. I love Pretty in Pink, and uh, again, it has that kind of idea of the family and the the, the broken family in, in the, yeah uh in respect of pretty and pink but um i do think perhaps visually it suffers a little bit because it wasn't john hughes actually behind the camera calling the shots he was around you know it was his project he produced it but it wasn't literally him directing that film and i think you can see the difference between the movies that he directed and the films that he was just oversaw more generally yeah. Um, because one of the things there's, there's two characters that I want to talk to you about throughout his kind of career. The first one is Ducky. Um, yeah. I found it quite difficult to understand Ducky's motivation because I always assumed that John Cryer was playing him as gay. And I, well, assumed, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. It's interesting yeah. you say that because Molly Ringwald has said since mm. obviously Ducky was gay. Yeah. I mean, a, a, a sort of carry on level. The guy's called Ducky. I mean, you know, <laughs> that's that's quite a sort of camp nickname, isn't it? Um, and just the the you know the way he wears his clothes, very sort of flamboyant um, with his hair. I, he was called Ducky because he had the ducktail hairdo, which is actually mm. why he was called Ducky. But um, you know, so there's something certainly something very uh, camp about him. Um, but uh, I don't, I you know, even though that's sort of there, and I think we can pick that out now. I don't feel that that was part of what John Hughes was no, writing no. and actually in the original script you know Andy and Ducky did get together so right um you know it was certainly it was certainly strongly suggested that mm. Ducky was incredibly attracted to Andy you know but I think but I think there's a there's a lot of guys in his movies and actually a lot of the pop stars around at that time as well you know they were sort of uh, I think the phrase back then was gender bender you right. know they were they were kind of quite flamboyant you know the new romantic movements you look at like pictures of duran duran from the yeah. 80s you know the big quiffed hair and the flamboyant outfits there was a real femininity about mm. those guys because i think i found it quite interesting to look at in terms of i feel he's the most ambiguous character across all of hughes's work and it was interesting co to consider him after i'd seen things like you know um bender in, ba in breakfast club um mm. Because generally, you kind of go for the kind of straightforward masculine male or a geek yeah. or a nerd. And there's no yeah. kind of shadow between that. And that, I feel like this is where Ducky fell into. So it was a bit strange yeah. to consider that he'd done that. And makes him a really interesting character, I think, mm. actually, because of that. Um, 
you know, and he, I mean, he does sort of nominally end up with, with a girlfriend at the end of the movie. It's all a little laboured. Um, and there were, you know, the whole ending was reshot to give it, a, you know, a different twist. Right. But certainly, you know, I think looking at him now, and I think if this movie was made now, absolutely, Ducky and, and Andy, it would be a sort of uh, gay best friend relationship. Yeah. And, you know, he would still be annoyed that Andy was with Blaine because Blaine represented a different social class and his friends who are, you know, the James Spader character, they're awful people. So they would still have that tension there but I just don't think we'd ever have expected them to get together. And that's what put people off the original ending. They filmed the original ending where Andy and Ducky get together and audiences just went, you know, test audiences, they said, we don't buy it. Right, <laughs> you okay. know? It's, there, there's no sexual chemistry between them. You know, they're great as best friends, but we don't buy them as boyfriend and girlfriend. Yeah. Uh, so they reshot it so that she did go off with, with uh, Blaine and it, it all of that, you know, with what you said, it all completely makes sense. Why should there be sexual chemistry between them when, mm. you know, really he's more of a gay best friend than anything else? It is interesting. Uh, it was one of the ones that just struck out to me, that was all. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, you and Molly Ringwald agree on that. Well, I'll take that. <laughs> uh, 1987, Some Kind of Wonderful. Um, I, I kind of read that this is, again, similar to Pretty in Pink, is essentially a John Hughes film that he just didn't direct, he just wrote it. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's essentially the same plot as as Pretty in Pink, just right. with r role reversals. So it's you know it's the sort of the outsider guy instead of the outsider girl who's in love with the rich girl instead of the rich boy. So you know it's the same love triangle, mm. um, and it's also directed by Howard Deutsch, who directed Pretty in Pink. Um, but with this time round, you you do get that ending where the two outsiders the geeky boy and the geeky girl end up together so at the end of some kind of wonderful he doesn't go off with the rich girl right. um he he goes off with someone from his own class from his own background from his own world so um that's the major difference but um yeah some kind of wonderful i i feel is sort of a reheated version of pretty and pink um and actually even though it was only a year later which is really nothing um, it it feels for me to have a lot less sort of energy and vibrancy about it. Mm -hmm. You can feel that it's sort of the end of the the era, if you like. You know, it was. I think it was the last. It was sort of the one of the last teen things that John Hughes was involved in, yeah. and you could tell that it was kind of you know we're coming to the end of things now. Right. Yeah, because uh, then you know you're going into <clears throat> the Great Outdoors, National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. Get into 1990 and Home Alone. Yeah. Um, did you see the Netflix movies that made us special about Home Alone? I didn't know. It's quite. It's quite good. It's it's all about the filming of it. There's a lot of stuff in there with Chris Chris Columbus. Um, yeah. So it's quite good to kind of see that. I don't think they touched too much on John Hughes. It was more to right, do with yeah. how the actor filmed it and. Yeah, yeah, and it's so funny because John Hughes, you know, that that that's his biggest film. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one of the biggest films of all time, in fact. You know, it was the biggest comedy ever for a long time. And um I think with 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 Home Alone, you know, we it, we became so obsessed with Macaulay Culkin in that, in it being a Macaulay Culkin movie. Um and then probably secondly a Chris Columbus movie, mm. but actually the John Hughes involvement I think got sort of pushed down the um the rankings quite a lot which i don't think hughes was bothered about you know he makes all the money but has yeah. none of the sort of the, the focus on him um but that you, you look at things in there and they are there's some absolutely classic john hughes themes going on yeah. the, the family for example you know they're going back family. to what we said right at the beginning mm -hmm. the dysfunctional family um sort of the home and the geography of the home and the setup of the home you know, that kind of Chicago suburban house, middle class house that is in a lot of his films. So, um, yeah, not a teen movie by any stretch, but no. there are a lot of familiar things in there. Definitely. Uh, going into the 90s, so this is kind of where it was primarily just writing at this point. Um, and it's quite interesting to not to after, you know, career opportunities in Dutch. Um, he adopted a pseudonym of Edward Dantes to do Beethoven and things yeah. like that. And so clearly he's yeah. pushing the fame away. He's just thinking, <laughs> this is it now. Twilight Hour is here. Yeah. And doing, I think he did, was it Flubber? Was it the, yeah. one of the Disney movies? Yeah. So mm -hmm. the, essentially these are kids' movies, Disney movies, where he's writing under a pseudonym. 
and it's, it's a job for hire you know it's yeah. it's relatively easy money i think the um when john candy died which was about 94 i think mm. john candy obviously uh, he almost you know he's um he's kind of muse really john candy yeah. in so many john hughes films i think when john candy died who was a friend of his and uh, at a young age i think that was sort of the final straw for, for john yeah. hughes in terms of seeking out hollywood fame you know i think he thought well if it can do that to john candy i'm just going to take a back seat and just you know not not go for that kind of hollywood lifestyle yeah. anymore because i actually put something in about john candy um for a little bit later on but um so over the years obviously they developed a close friendship um and uh, it was a weird interview that i found with uh, vince vaughn of all people who apparently was a good right. friend of john hughes which i wasn't necessarily aware of um, and okay. he mentioned, like you just said, he said, you know, he talked a lot about how much he loved John Candy and he thinks that if John Candy had lived longer, John Hughes may have made more films as a director. So clearly there was yeah. something in there. Yeah. 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 I mean, there's a sensitivity to him, um, which is actually why we like him, certainly in terms of his team movies. We like the sensitive aspects yeah. of his writing. I think there are other aspects as well, but um, there's clearly a sensitivity to him as a person and a, a sensitivity to him uh, as a writer you know that's that's why we're still talking about the breakfast club 35 years later yeah uh okay so then we move into his films as a director um so i'm more up to speed with these <laughs> so we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll back and forth a little bit um so yeah. starting off with 1984 16 candles um yep. just to kind of kick off with that when i, I watched it uh probably a few weekends ago and straight away, so some issues that are still prevalent today, so things like body image and fitting in and that kind of stuff. So that's adding to the most, the almost timeless nature of John Hughes's films that is coming out here. Um, there was more than just a teenage point of view in that film because I thought you also got the point of view of the forgotten and unlooked over middle child with the Molly yep. Ringwald character. Um, the second character I wanted to talk to you uh, about is uh, Long Duck Dong. <laughs> Oof, ouch. As soon as, as as soon as he appeared on screen, and I thought, there's a gong going off every time yes. he says something. Yes. And he's eating, he's using a knife and fork as chopsticks. And I just yeah. thought, wow, I didn't expect this. Um, yes. Were you aware of maybe the initial reaction to that kind um, of I that's a good question. Um I no, not particularly, because I um came to Sixteen Candles, you know, later. Mm. And by that point, it was blatantly obvious that this was awful. Um, I don't know in the mid 80s what the reaction was. But then at the same time, you know, the fact that it was written and the fact that it got through uh, and, uh, you know, probably, uh, you know, lots of uh, executives and people reading the script and it all got signed off and it all got made, and it all got okayed, suggests that there just wasn't that atmosphere then yeah um that we have now um but it is it is quite horrific um and i i don't feel you know i don't i don't feel that it's in any way sort of deliberately horrible i mm -hmm. think it's just i think it's just an ignorance an ignorance yeah. from that era of you know race relations yeah um and uh it, that is what it, it is what it is you know and um uh, it's awful now but mm. um uh i mean the the guy was was i think he's playing someone from china isn't he or, yeah um, and but he's like vietnamese japanese. in real life yeah. yeah but then they used turning japanese at one point as well when he pulls up in the car and i just thought what's going on here yeah it's just this horrible mishmash of stereotypes and awful outdated cliches yeah um and and there are others in that movie as well. You know, there are some sort of treatments of of women in it that uh, in girls in it because they're you know high school girls, mm -hmm. which don't sit very well now. Um, but I think you know it, John Hughes, we sort of rightfully elevate to a you know auteur status, a legend, and I think in many ways that he is. But you know, these are films from well that's well over 35 years ago that yeah. things have changed times have changed a lot of mm. things have changed and i think it's inevitable that there are going to be moments that are horribly outdated yeah 
it was really interesting looking at it afterwards because it's the one character from that film that has its own Wikipedia page because of the reaction and because of everything afterwards. Um, but in Kurt Honeycutt's book, uh, there's there's a whole little bit where um, Geddy Watanabe, the actor, yeah. um, he said that he actually thinks that the reaction might have been different if a scene was left in because apparently they shot a scene where he jumped on the stage during the dance and rapped about what he likes in America. So the actor was right. convinced that maybe if they'd left that in, everyone would have been right. okay with him. Which, okay. Yeah. I mean, that's that's a nice optimistic way of looking <laughs> at things. You know, I I mean, it's I, I, I watch it now and I squirm because it's awful. But I, you know, I think that, uh, you know, I, that there are, there were worse things happening. I think it just came from a place of yeah. just kind of silly ignorance of the time. Yeah. You know, I don't think there was a malice there. Because mm -hmm. um, I mean, one of the things as well that I think was a bit more noticeable to me, because I've not necessarily done these films in order. So I'd, yeah. you know, I've, I've seen Breakfast Club a few years ago, Ferris and all that kind of stuff. So going back to 16 Candles, there's, all, there's a lot of things in it that feel like the playing for laughs. So there's a lot of musical cues about like, oh, this is how you're going to respond now because that's shocking or that's supposed to be funny and, you know, different yeah. things like that. So it was a bit strange to see them rather than just relying on the dialogue, yeah. the characters, the chemistry that we had. Um, you mentioned the the kind of representation of the women in the film because obviously it's teenage girls and things like that. The one thing that struck me in that film was the geeks. Why does every geek have to have a physical deformity for them to be yeah. a geek? Um, yeah but again i suppose yeah it's, again of the time as you mentioned yeah and i think that actually the movie that john hughes wanted to make and had written by that point was the breakfast club yeah. um which is a much more sensitive portrayal mm. and he wasn't allowed to because he was known for his comedy writing and so you know he had to churn out this comedy which has some great moments i mean i'm yeah. not going to trash the entire thing <laughs> but I think this this wasn't sort of the pet project of John Hughes that The Breakfast Club was, mm. and so I think it, I think it does kind of uh, tread water a little bit, um, and just um, yeah go for some cliches a little bit more than perhaps other projects that he was more emotionally involved with yeah. um, went on to do. Uh, so going on to the Breakfast Club then, because uh, it was floating around as a detention was the working title for a while. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so... Which would make more sense, really. <laughs> yeah, just <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's it's a phrase now that we just sort of know, and it's just a thing. But actually, you know, it doesn't. And and, and actually, over here, you know, the idea of Saturday detention mm. isn't a thing, as far as I'm aware. It never was when I was at school. You know, so the whole concept of it, yeah. The whole concept of it to, to us in the UK um, was quite odd, really. Detention for me was like an hour after school ended. Yeah, uh, It wasn't coming back at the weekend to do it. <laughs> for the full um, day as well on a Saturday. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the whole, the, you know, the Breakfast Club and just what it represents, I think, over here is, is you know, I mean, we loved it over here, but it's still something that's um, very American. Yeah. Um, so did did you come to this later or were you... Um... Yeah, I came, I came to this later. I mean, um, thankfully, I wasn't old enough to watch any of these when they actually came out. <laughs> right. So all, all of them I came to later. Um, and uh, I mean, I, what I loved about it and what I continue to love about it is the five perfectly drawn characters, their individual mm -hmm. traits... Um, and I love the the respect it gives to their emotions. Um, and it can be, you know, there are moments in The Breakfast Club where I squirm a little bit, but I don't think it's because it's outdated. I think it's just because you're really seeing raw emotions um, on show. You know, that's what it's about. It's about people who have the outward appearance of a certain type, whether mm. that's a jock or a princess or whatever. But by the end of the day, those have kind of been stripped away and we actually see what's at the core of these people. Um, and so watching that, that kind of stripping process, you know, is quite tough because yeah. they go through some, some, some tough things and um, some tough things are said, some revelations come out about their personal lives that, you know, that are unpleasant. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's, you know, that's what I remembered about it. And what I still like about it today is that, I mean, it's really gutsy. Yeah. <laughs> it, and, 
and it, John Hughes wasn't afraid to give teenagers respect like that and to say actually their emotions matter because mm. um, as I mentioned I came to it quite late um, I watched it for the first time about five years ago and it was on a, a watch list for a while and I just decided I've got time I'll watch it and literally I then used it in my teaching on the following Wednesday because we were writing scripts at the time and I just thought the, the students are struggling with understanding how to develop the characters, how to introduce the characters. This is yeah. the perfect film to show them in order to do yeah. that. And, yeah. you know, I'd wished that I'd seen it in a year earlier and embedded it a little bit better, but it's still in the, there now. The introduction of the characters is amazing because actually they're introduced by being dropped off in yeah. cars. And the way that they're introduced, the types of car, who's in the car with them, Actually, Bender, I think, walks. He, he doesn't walk, even arrive yeah. by car, you know. And so even from that moment, you learn a lot about the characters. Yeah. You, um, just from the way they're dropped off outside of school. You know, because you've got the, um, the... The names are going to escape me now. Molly Ringwald's character. Um, yeah. You know, by a dad, and he's saying things like, I'll make it up to you, don't worry. You know, she's got... It's quite a posh aesthetic straight away. Yeah, um, yeah. Brian by his mum, who apparently is actually Anthony Michael Hall's real mum, which I didn't realise. Right, yes, um, yeah, I think that I think because they were all he as he especially was so young, he had yeah. to have his <laughs> had to have his parents around on set as kind of you know to look after him. He gets yeah. the slight dig from his sister on the way out the car, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. Bender walks. Emilio Estevez's character, you know, the dad sort of saying like, "You're not going to mess this up. You're going to get yeah, in yeah. there," all that kind of stuff. Yeah, um, and then Allison she goes to walk towards the parents' window and the, dri- the car drives off. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Um, no, it's brilliant. The, the, and, and the way those characters are carried through, you know, this, their traits, their outfits, their hairstyles, um, and, the, you know, the way they speak, I just think it's, it's a brilliant... And, it, you know, it, you could say, well, it's stereotypes of type. Well, yeah, I think it is. You know, that's kind of the mm-hmm. point of it. By the end, they're maybe not the stereotypes, but certainly when they start we are expected to to treat them as stereotypes. The whole yeah. point of the film is to see beyond that. There's definitely more to a stereotype than, you know. Yeah. Because um, it was really interesting, actually. Thank you for flagging it up, being in the uh, the Zoom call on Sunday with Ali Shidi. Oh, right, yeah. Oh, you yeah. did that, did you? Yeah, yeah, it was good. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, really interesting to see what she thought about different things and, you know, all that kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, and she's very, very sort of bubbly and happy about it. You know, I don't think that's necessarily always been the case. Mm. Um, because you know people want to move on from yeah. stuff that happened 35 years ago but I think when you sort of hit mid 50s you kind of go oh it's oh I just accept <laughs> it now that's what I'll be remembered for that'll be on my gravestone you know fine I was Alison in the breakfast club it may have been a different call if Judd Nelson was in there I think yes <laughs> yeah I think he's still sort of raging inside <laughs> about various issues uh, okay, so uh, same year again, which surprised me. Uh, we get Weird Science, and yeah. so again, this was one that I caught up with just the weekend before. Um, straight away, the theme song by Oingo, Oingo Boingo, which was uh, Danny Elfman's band, that just yeah. came off straight away. And I was like, all right, okay, I'm gonna yeah. enjoy this. I think um, I didn't yeah. actually, I didn't enjoy it as much as I thought I was going to. Um, yeah, and I, I wrote something down which is a little bit pretentious, but if John Hughes's films are autobiographical, I think this is puberty. I think this is where we are with weird science. Um, it's yeah. very voyeuristic. It's very male-centered. It's very kind of that kind of... I mean, I teach male gaze as part of representation. It's very along those, yeah. those lines. Um, and yeah. I think I much preferred Anthony Michael Hall's character in Breakfast Club to, the, to yeah. weird science. Um, yeah. It's just, I think I was on board with it for, a, for a, probably about half an hour. And then it just began to fall apart for me a little bit. And I don't know whether or not yeah. that's something that I was expecting um, to happen in the film or anything like that. But definitely towards the end, I just I'd lost interest when the mutants yeah. arrive on the bikes and you know yeah. she, she, turn, she turns Bill Paxton into a sludge. I just can't, <laughs> what am I watching? Yeah, I mean it's it was it always surprises me how fantastical it is. Mm. Um, even before all of that happens, I mean, listen, the very concept of creating your own kind of super babies <laughs> is fantastical anyway, but the, you know, they go even further with that. Like the, the rooms will change color and their suits will change color and stuff when they go from one room to the next, you know, but there's not, 
I mean, even if you wanted to tr to give the the sort of the whole Frankenstein's monster idea of creating your own person, give that some credence, you know, that that might have possibly happened. Mm. Then there are other things in it that are just utterly nonsensical. <laughs> that there's really there's absolutely no scientific background to. And so that always disappoints me that he goes just that step too far or several yeah. steps too far with the fantasy element of it. Um, but also, you know, I think that there is, there is a sort of laddie element to John Hughes. National Lampoon was very blokey as a magazine, you know, mm. um, and it was funny and nostalgic and clever in many, many ways, but you know, they weren't afraid to do sort of smutty gags. And I think that, um, John Hughes still had a part of that in him. Um, yeah. And actually there were bits, I think, well, we saw bits of that in, in 16 Candles. I think there were bits that were cut out of The Breakfast Club that would have suggested that, that didn't end up in the final movie. Um, I, I think this was sort of like a last last gasp for him of his sort of, <laughs> like you said, his puberty, like his adolescent years, his laddish years. I suppose ultimately though, you know, the, ultimately the movie is about, look, just be yourself and be happy to be outsiders and all this kind of stuff the usual john hughes message so mm -hmm. there is a sweet message in there and i yeah. think that the the relationship the two boys have with their two girlfriends is very sweet and tender and and even you know kelly de brock becomes sort of like a sort of uh, life coach to the boys really doesn't she yeah um but you know you have to jump over quite a lot of hurdles to get there <laughs> it's almost <laughs> like a cleanse he's just he's getting it out with this one yeah, yeah, you know, it's his third his third film in this deal that he had with Universal, the third film he had with Anthony Michael Hall. Um, so, you know, I think, like we said right at the start, when you're churning so much out, when you've got so many deals going on, when you've got so much product out there, mm. not everything is going to be perfect. No. It'd be amazing if it was. It'd be really strange if it was, I think. <laughs> well, maybe yeah. then you're into the Christopher Nolan idea, which is you just do a film every two or three years, you know? But if That's you're doing it. two a year, then, you know, the quality control, I think, is is just not going to be quite so high. I mean, just the time going into doing two a year just boggles my mind anyway. Yeah. Um, so 1986, we're on to Ferris, so your favourite. Um, yeah. Start us off with that one. Yeah, I mean, I think Ferris, for me, is sort of the crowning glory because I think it says everything that he's ever wanted to say. And it does it without the 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 cheap jokes as much mm. the smutty jokes um there's not even you know it's not even a romance in it because ferris and sloan are just together you know there's no suggestion that there's any kind of drama there or any conflict you know they're just together the, dr the drama and the conflict is between um you know ferris and cameron yeah. so it's it's a buddy movie really it's you know it's about their relationship um but you know it's for me it's like there's definitely elements of Ducky in, in Ferris in the way that he dresses, the way that he looks. And actually, you know, Matthew Broderick and John Cryer were sort of interchangeable in many ways. I think there were several films where Broderick was cast and then he left and they got John Cryer in and all this kind of stuff. So they're very similar kinds of actors and looking actors. But, um, but Ferris is, you know, obviously much more confident than Ducky ever was and, and middle class and, and just... The fact that he can do anything, I think, is is to me like this sort of it's like the ultimate teen movie. It's mm. like I'm gonna create the ultimate teenage character who unites people, who brings a community together, who helps his best friend, who, you know, says he's gonna marry his teenage sweetheart. You know, he can do no wrong. Um, and that that's a really um uplifting kind of idea, isn't it? You know? Yeah. He's done, he's done the, John Hughes has done the teenage angst. It's not, the, the teenage angst isn't existent in Ferris. There's teenage angst in Cameron, but not in Ferris. This is just a celebration. Yeah, this is just, let's enjoy being a teenager for a little bit. Yeah, um, yeah. Because as I mentioned before, we look at this in terms of, um, so paper one for the film studies GCSE, we look at the development of American cinema between two films from the same genre. So we look at, um, Rebel That a Cars from 1955 and then we go all the way up to Ferris Bueller's Day Off and there's a clear difference between not knowing who teenagers were the kind of people that they yeah. are and things like that in Rebel to now we can celebrate them, we can enjoy them and yeah. look at you know the little cheeky chappies, they've got all this charisma about them yeah. and things like that and yeah. I think instantly with Ferris 
the wink into the camera, the break in the fourth wall, things like that. If that yeah. wasn't there, I don't think it would have been, I, th- I, found, I think it would have been more difficult to buy him as a character. But as soon yeah. as he looks to you and he says, yeah, I'm taking a day off and this is, these are all the things <laughs> that I've done. It's like, right, I'm sold here. This is it. Yeah. This is a great Yeah, character. I mean, it's, it's so much his film, not just because he's the title character, but he's almost like the director of the film, the writer yeah. of the film. You know, it's, he's in total charge of that, of that movie. Um, and that knowingness, by that point, you know, this is mid 80s, there'd been um, obviously five, six years of 80s teen movies. So there'd yep. been a lot out there. They, they were a normal thing. It wasn't the, the latest thing so much. They were quite mainstream by this point. So I think you had to, if you wanted to keep things fresh, you had to inject a new way of dealing with it. Mm. Um, and we probably saw it again a few years later with Bill and Ted, just that sort of tongue, slightly tongue in cheek way. Of, of dealing with the um, the stereotypes, dealing with the, our expectations and audience, and saying, "Look, we know you've seen other movies like this. We know that you know how these end. You know, you, but we're just gonna be a little bit more uh, yeah. cheeky about it and a little bit more knowing about it." And then, as well, imagine if you had a day off, what would you do with a day off? You know, what would you do with a full yeah. day? Especially, yeah, if I mean, dad, it's a great if your friend's dad has got a Ferrari. <laughs> It's a real water cooler discussion, isn't it? It's like, yeah. what if? Um, and uh, what, what I love about it, though, is that actually the things that he does aren't things I would ever have thought of, really. Mm. Um, they're really classy things. Going to an art gallery, going to a posh restaurant. You know, this, I, I love the way that it brings that kind of high culture and then mixes it with a baseball game or a street parade, you know, singing a really naff 60s song at a street yeah. parade. Um, you know, I love that that mix of, of poshness, classiness, um, with just silliness. Yeah. Um, and again, that's just that thing of anything is possible. Um, when you've got Ferris there, you can't predict, really. Mm. You know, he could do anything and he can succeed at anything. There are so many little jokes in it as well that just, I, I, I feel like I miss them sometimes. And then when I go back, I just laugh at them. Like, one of them was... Um, so when I watched it again recently, um, Ed Rooney stood at the front door that a, a lot of flowers get delivered and it says, I hope you're feeling well from all the English faculty and staff. Yeah. And I just thought, what is this about? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, it doesn't, books... it doesn't uh, make sense um, because, he, I mean, at a very basic level, I don't think he could fit all that stuff into one day. I yeah. just don't think there are enough hours in the day for everything that he did. Um, so, th- but, but it, you know, it's... It, it, because it has that knowing wink about it, but actually Weird Science didn't have so much. Um, you forgive it some of those inconsistencies. Yeah. Really, would there would there be a sign? Excuse me. Would there be a sign on the water tower saying "Save Ferris"? <laughs> you know, he's only been off school for one morning. Already, there's a sign up. So would that happen? No, it wouldn't. But you know, it's just this fantasy world where he can create and do anything he wants. And it, I mean, it instantly creates that world as well with all, all those little bits of the safe Ferris and the police chief saying, "Oh, how's yeah. your son doing?" We we heard you, yeah. you know, it's just all those little bits that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a real treat to teach, actually, as well. To be honest, um, it's one of those that you're kind of happy to do it. Um, I mean, I st- I absolutely stand by. I think there's, I think there's one moment when Jeannie is shouting down the phone to the police officer, "You do you speak English?" Yeah. great so I think that's a little awkward now um and unpleasant but really you know for a film of that age which is a very white middle class movie mm-hmm. um I actually think that it's it still holds up yeah uh so then the year after we're going into uh planes trains and automobiles which to me I thought clearly is first kind of foray into more adult material um, and then it became clear afterwards, reading up on him and reading up on his life, that a lot of this was replicating his work in advertising, you know, from yep. the, the time before. Um, again, this was a first time watch for me recently. I love this. I thought this was great. Um, yeah. Steve Martin and John Candy's chemistry was fantastic. And I just thought, what's going to happen next? And every time they got into something new, whether it was the, you know, the car or anything like that, I just thought, well, this isn't going to go well. Something, you know, <laughs> you're expecting it to happen. Um, I yeah. think it's definitely quintessentially 80s. Even the yes. score at the beginning of the film when he's running for the cab against Kevin Bacon, I yeah. just thought, this is yeah. 80s all over. 
Um, and a lot of the kind of, this was my realization that he worked with a lot of the same people because I was recognizing different actors um, yeah. from things like Planes and Trains, um, Ferris from Home Alone yeah. as well. Um, I mean, yeah. the the lady that works at the airport that Steve Martin screams at, I just yeah. thought, you didn't get yeah. this treatment in Home Alone. <laughs> You're a little <laughs> bit better off there. <laughs> Yeah, and it's, you know, it, it has completely that idea of the family that we've talked about already. Yep. You know, that's at the heart of it. Someone desperate to get back to see their family for Thanksgiving. Um, but I think it's also, perhaps, perhaps with this and Ferris, is, is John Hughes at his peak of blending sort of slapstick silliness mm -hmm. with emotion. Yep. And that's, you know, for, and for the emotion to feel genuine and to feel heartfelt, Lots of people try it, but we've sat in, how many films have you sat in where they've tried to be emotional and just like, oh my God, this feels so calculated now. It feels yeah. like such a mood shift that it doesn't make sense. Um, but, but John Hughes was very skillful and actually his actors were very skillful as well. I think mm. Steve Martin in, in outside of John Hughes films, you know, did it very well. Parenthood's probably another one um, where you can shift from the comedy to the emotion yeah. really smoothly and John Candy is brilliant you know John Candy is has a sort of tragedy to him ultimately and yeah. he's funny and he's annoying but I mean he's this tragic figure which is why he's invited to the dinner at the end you know because you want you want him to be happy um you don't want him just to bugger off and never be seen again you know <laughs> he, he has you, that you weird have, thing sorry he has that weird thing where like you, you can you can feel sorry for him even with the slightest look of his face and yeah. it happens a lot in planes and trains, and I feel like that's kind of the, his character. But even subtly in something like Home Alone, mm -hmm. where he's trying to coax um, Kevin's mum to get on the kind of the poker truck with them, and yeah. she's a bit like, mm, and it's just the the emotion that comes across yeah. in his face. It's, yeah, yeah, totally. Um, okay, so then eighty eight, one that I'm I've not seen, I'm not too familiar with. Uh, she's having a baby. Yeah, um, which is why Kevin Bacon was in Planes, Trains, and Automobiles right, briefly, yeah. because actually John Hughes was sort of making back to back. Mm. She's having a baby, so he got Kevin Bacon to do a cameo in Planes and Trains, and he got John Candy to do a cameo in She's Having a Baby because right, they were okay. all being filmed around the same time and being made around the same time. Um, but it's kind of you know I think John Hughes sensed that his teenage stars had had enough of mm. working in that genre um which is fine you know that's what happens you can't be a teenager forever and i think he sensed that about himself as well that right. he was now 40-ish mm. and you know he'd done he'd said what he wanted to say in teen movies and he had to move on as well and so um she's having a baby is quite interesting because it is you know, with someone like Kevin Bacon, it's a former teen star. I mean, it's someone who five yeah. years earlier would have been in one of his teen movies. But now, of course, they're sort of 20 something yuppie types, very much of the era, um, and just investigating the hardships and the toughness of, of being a married couple and being a pregnant couple and all yeah. the things that that brings. Um, so it was him maturing and just moving into a different world mm. uh, but i still think that it's a world that's sort of relatable to his previous films you know it's like characters from his previous teen movies who have now grown up a bit almost like a sequel to something mm. and then just exploring their the, the new problems they have they don't have the teenage problems anymore they have the 20 something problems of work of yeah. marriage and of, of child of, of having children I suppose that's kind of pinned down into his the idea that he's got an autobiographical stamp going across the whole thing yeah. because um, there's a lot of stuff in here that apparently is referenced to him and his wife having a baby quite early yeah. out of the teens yeah. and moving in, getting married, obviously, things like that. Um, yeah. Apparently, he struggled to find an audience. It's not necessarily one of the most well-known or kind of well-favoured ones. Um, it does exactly. use um, the, Kate, the Kate Bush song, This Woman's Work, in it, which is just a fantastic moment. It's a fantastic song and it's a fantastic moment. I think what people do remember of this film, which isn't much, but if they remember anything, it's, it's the use of the Kate Bush song. Right, okay. um, but, you know, it's, I think after, in, in, that, in that sort of late 80s world, all of the people from the, a few years earlier who were involved in the teen movie era were struggling to find their place, whether that's right. the actors 
or or even John Hughes as the, as the king of those films. Mm. You know, they'd all moved on. The world had moved on a bit. So it's like, well, what is their place in the world now? And which is why, you know, Molly Ringwald and Rob Lowe and Emilio Estevez and that, they, they were just in flop movie after flop movie. You know, they couldn't, they couldn't re- recreate their success that they'd had as teenagers. And I don't think for a while John Hughes could either because he just didn't quite know what arena he was meant to be working in. Mm. It's quite strange when you think about the genre shift from the 80s to the 90s because one of the things that we talk about in terms of context for these films for the 80s is that you either found teenagers being applauded and celebrated in teen films or yeah. being the victims of horror during that kind yeah. of thing that happened then. Yeah. But then when you get the eight, the 90s, you're into things like sci-fi and action, and it's just weird that yeah. it's just defined by those decades and there's not much crossover. Yeah, I know, and I think perhaps that's why we, we remember it so well. It's because it does, whether this is coincidence or not, it fits neatly into the 80s as a decade. Yeah. You know, it's like the Beatles being associated with the 60s because mm. they'd split up by the 1970s. So, you know, they, it fit very neatly. And I think the teen movies fit very neatly. You know, when I wrote a book about 80s teen movies, I started late 70s and finished early 90s. But that really, you know, the, the, the main chunk of it was very neatly sitting within 1980 to 1989. Yeah. Um, and I, I do think that, that as decades change, um, almost subconsciously, we move forward mm. a little bit and take new steps and want to be interested in new things and perhaps by nine you know come 1990 people are thinking breakfast club it's only five years old but it feels like an 80s movie we're in the 90s now we want to move forward and do other things and i do think that that you know there's sort of historical proof that that does happen yeah um, a real sort of psychological shift so um i think that's partly why the 90s teen movies took on such a different or a lot of them took on a different um, mood mm. because it just, it felt, especially if you're a teenager, right? Five years is a huge amount of time. Yeah. You know, definitely. Um, and to think of something that's five years old, you know, from 1985, this is 1990, that's years ago. I'm not that's interested so in that. Old hat. You know, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Because, yeah. I mean, just even thinking about the 90s, I'm trying to think of teen films that were released throughout the 90s, and I kind of go from, end of the decade 89 to the next one i can think of is american pie so again it's... yeah well the, the the late 90s they really came back yeah um the, the key one in the middle is clueless which sort of bridges oh, the sure. gap really it kind of mm. bridges the gap between the john hughes movies and the the late 90s movies with yeah. you know american pie and cruel intentions and all mm. those kind of things um but it did really take 10 years for them to come back into fashion yeah. and the next generation of, of teenagers to come along and discover them all over again mm. um okay so we're nearly there uh uncle book next on 1989 um, <coughs> yeah so again I, more I family this, stuff more family even more family stuff yeah. strangely yeah. that they're gonna go for the kind of almost from dysfunctional to fully almost broken family um, yeah. The real struggle that Tia has in terms of a relationship with her mum, especially. Um, I felt like Tia was almost like the spiritual sister to Alison from Breakfast Club. I felt like there were a yeah. lot of things going on there that were really similar. Um, yeah. And again, it's it's more or less to do with the point of view of a teenager, but more to do with the kind of, in, I would say, family dynamic in general, I think. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And, and again, actually, I think that Macaulay Culkin in both that and in Home Alone, you know, you could easily see him as sort of an, uh, some relation to Ferris Bueller because yeah. he can do it all. You know, he's totally in charge, totally in control. And there's something very entertaining about seeing a teenager do that, getting one up on the adults. Mm. Something arguably even more entertaining, certainly more funny, about seeing this tiny kid doing it. <laughs> um, the tiny kid who can do anything, who can do no wrong, who's smart, who can outwit everybody. Um, and you see the, the the early signs of that when he's when he's interrogating um, Buck in Uncle Buck. You know, he's he's got a, a, an adult's head on a child's body, really. Hasn't yeah, he? I found it quite cute to read that. Um, apparently, John Candy put post-it notes on his head, so Macaulay Culkin <laughs> remembered the lines during the interrogation scene. <laughs> 
So you can just imagine him sat there, you know. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> now I will watch that scene with a new, new <laughs> images in my head now. See if you can spot him reading yeah. the lines. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then final one then, so 1991 in Curly Sue, which, you know, didn't go down too well with everybody, I don't think. Yeah. Um, I, I've not seen this one. I'm not sure how familiar you are with it. Not massively familiar, but it, yeah. it's, you know, it's John Hughes. You've got, you got, because I think we should never forget that John Hughes was a businessman. Mm -hmm. And it's always, you know, I, I, that doesn't mean that his emotions aren't genuine and everything he put into his teen movies isn't genuine. I, you know, I really believe that it was. Yeah. But at the same time, he knew about brands mm -hmm. and he knew about fashions and fads. And the teen movies that he did were a fashion. The world moved on. And I think with, with Home Alone and when, with Macaulay Culkin, um, he discovered a new fashion and a new fad, which was the, you know, the kids movie. Um, yeah. And you saw that in Curly Sue, Baby's Day Out, Home Alone movies, Uncle Buck to a certain degree. You know, so he was, he was smart enough up here, business-minded enough to think, I can kind of riff on this genre for a while. Mm and do several movies um, that focus on, focus on little kids. Um, and, you know, I've spoken to people about him and they've gone, look, genius, brilliant writer, creator, totally emotional, you know, totally genuine. But, he, you know, let's not forget that <laughs> he knew about the system and about business. And yeah. that's, that's why he got people to direct his scripts, you know, because... Mm. He could have brand hues out there, but just not have to do the daily grind of directing it, you know. So as a producer, I think, uh, which, you know, he was more in his later years, he sort of cottoned on to this new fad, which was the, the little kid movie. Yeah, one of the interesting things as well about in terms of him writing and directing <laughs> and things like that that I picked up on was um, apparently he believed that there were very specific screenplays that only he could direct. So the films that right. he ended up doing, so Breakfast Club, Ferris, all that kind of stuff, because he yeah. knew what the vision was all the way through and he didn't want to trust anybody else with those. Um, right. Then obviously, you know, he then had the protege of Howard Deutsch with uh, Pretty and yeah. Pink and things like that. So again, I, th yeah. I thought that was quite interesting to look into. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and maybe those movies that he did direct are the ones that feel slightly more genuine and, yeah. and earnest you know and, and knowing that what you just said you know you assume it might not be correct but we assume that therefore it was a real pet project for him mm. you know it's a real labor of love for him if he didn't want anyone else to direct it this was something that was personally really close to his heart perhaps yeah. more so than some kind of wonderful which was a bit of a cash in on the fad that he'd helped to create right yeah um so, I mean, we've already mentioned uh, his, some of his frequent collaborators, so people like John Candy. Uh, the, some familiar names come up in the credits, so producers like Neil Tannen, Michelle Manning, <clears throat> Zach Fujimoto, yeah. the cinematographer, Iron Newborn yeah. from music. Um, one of the things that we look at in terms of auteur theory is key kind of trademarks that go through all of their films. So, obviously, we've got youth, the kind of dysfunctional family that we mentioned before, um, anti-authority. And there was a there was a really interesting quote that for kind of for us and teaching and things like that is that apparently when John Hughes first watched Rebel Without a Cause, he sympathized with James Dean's torment over his incommunicative parents. But then after he had his own kids, he went back and watched it and then sympathized <laughs> with James Dean's dad. So, right. <laughs> that was yeah. quite interesting. Well, that, yeah, and that would make sense perhaps with his you know why he stopped making teen movies i mean you can't you can't make teen movies and be a teen movie auteur if mm. you stop believing in what they're fighting for <laughs> and he was already you know in his mid-30s when he was making them so you can understand that just he he grew up you don't stop growing up once you become an adult you know you have opinion changes when you're an adult as much as you do as a kid yeah. and it, probably he just didn't buy into that anymore because you know, his own kids were probably getting close to that age themselves. Yeah. And I think maybe that is why he went into the kind of smaller kiddie films or aimed at those yeah. kind of because of his own children, essentially. Yeah. Um, yeah. Again, some things that we've mentioned, so about stock characters or stereotypes, it, it almost sounds like a criticism, but I feel like he's one of the people that does it well and does it in terms yeah. of we're going to give you a different representation or an alternative approach to these people. Um, yeah. And then sentimentality, because there was a big thing in the book about um, he 
he wants films to be a departure from reality or he wanted films to be a departure from reality and that the idea was that it's going to end well because sometimes life doesn't end well and I want you to kind of feel this sense and he you know unashamedly you know sentimental which I think is absolutely fine <laughs> yeah and it, it I think what's very interesting about all of those things whether it's the stereotype characters or the sentiment is that they can eat you know, I'm, I'm, as a film critic, you see this all the time. Sometimes you can use those words as a criticism of a film, mm -hmm. uh, but it's all really, it's not, it's not about the sentiment or the stereotypes per se, it's how they're done. Yeah. And if they're written well, or especially performed well, and I think Hughes always chose the right people to perform them, then you can get away with it. And it <laughs> could even be the same line, you know, the same line said by someone who's not a great performer, could be a real stinker and it could ruin the film but if it's delivered by John Candy it could make the film you know yeah. and I think that 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 um, there's a very fine line with those things between what's genius and what's terrible and a lot of it is down to and a lot of it's down to the post-production you know with John Hughes especially the editing was really critical to mm. how his films were made and I know Breakfast Club was really made in the editing room and it's perhaps a little overlooked in, in film studies and certainly popular reviewing how much editing plays a part. Yeah. Uh, that you could film a movie and it could all be you know, recorded and done, but actually you could look back at it and go, this makes no sense whatsoever. Mm. But it's down to what goes on in the editing room to cut it together and make it and shape it into something that's really coherent. Um, and again, you know, you can edit sentimentality so that it's beautiful rather than awful. Yeah, and that's definitely kind of one of the lasting things, the timelessness of his films that comes across, definitely. Um, yeah. So last little bit then, I suppose. So um, the kind of thinking about the legacy that he left on cinema. So obviously he, he died in 2009. I mean, even the story of him dying kind of got me, the fact that he'd gone to visit his son and had a heart attack, and I just thought, that's awful, you know. Um, yeah. So immediately kind of following that, there were tributes from him and his family from um, the Oscars that they did. They did a, a kind of like yeah. memorial for him. Um, apparently he's got countless unfilmed scripts, which I think is no surprise to anybody uh, with the amount yeah. that he was writing. I just wanted to pull out a quote from the book just before I ask you kind of like a final question. Um, so one of the things from the book says, uh, he connected with an entire generation in a way that hasn't been duplicated since. He broke down the veneer of high school stereotypes to discover not what separates teens, but what unites them. His films connected because they, to, they spoke to teens as if they were adults. He saw no reason why the thoughts and emotions of 16 year olds were any less valid than he, than he was at 36. Yeah. Which I think sums everything up Sums pretty much. exactly yeah. yeah whoever wrote that is brilliant <laughs> is that kirk who wrote that i think that was kirk yeah <laughs> yeah yeah i mean that I, I think that there are there are all kinds of reasons why his films are great and why they've lasted but certainly the teen movies the main thing is the respect that he gave the characters and yeah. the belief that he had in their own problems and you know in a way now that we take that for granted i think mm. it's like well well, why wouldn't he, you know, because we've had a, all the years since of films that have been influenced by him. Yeah. But before that, you know, if you were watching Porky's or you were watching um, Animal House or stuff like that, you know, they're, they're just sort of crazy, sexy, riotous romps. You know, yeah. they're, they're not really about giving contemporary 80s teenagers a voice. No. Um, and that's what he did. He didn't deal in nostalgia. He didn't deal in, oh, weren't things better back then? He dealt with the here and now, the music of that time, and the type of people who were in high school at that time. Yeah. Um, so last thing then, I'm yeah. just thinking about his legacy kind of moving forward. I've spoken a lot recent, on recent podcasts about my love for Spider-Man Homecoming. I think it's one of the kind of <laughs> yeah. underrated Marvel films that have come <laughs> out in recent years. And there's yeah. a lot of Hughes in that film. Is there anything that you've seen recently that you think this is Hughes? Um, I mean, oh God, it put me on the spot. I mean, I see Sorry. it all the time. No, no, it's fine because in a way I see it all the time and I'm always surprised to see it in, um, I was, I tell you, I was watching a music video the other day. I, for my own podcast, I interviewed a, a singer called Shura, who's a, like an indie pop singer. Okay. And I was watching a lot of her videos and she's done a, you know, she's 
too young to remember John Hughes <laughs> when he came out. But she's done a music video that is complete. You know, it's, it's set in high school. It's Sherma High School. It's completely the whole kind of uh, Pretty and Pink Breakfast Club setup. Um, and um, I just thought even now for someone in 2020, who is probably, you know, herself was, is a millennial, mm. you know, so wasn't around for this, it still comes through. And you still see it in teen movies like the Spider-Man that you mentioned um, and others, you know, you still see them referenced way more so that that sort of second phase in the 90s of teen movies like 10 things i hate about you and american mm. pie stuff like that you know they were huge but i don't really see them referenced so much i don't really see people going back to them in the same way that people go back to the 80s stuff from john hughes yeah um uh so it still surprises me you know we were both on this zoom chat with ali sheedy mm. celebrating 35 years of the breakfast club it still surprises me that 35 years later, there is enough interest in that movie yeah. for that to happen, for it to be a thing. Um, and I'm very glad it has, but yeah. you know, that it, it just, that there are so many other genres of films that just don't have that kind of longevity. And ultimately it's, it's down to the, the realism. It's down to watching those films like Rebel Without a Cause, you know, mm. that's even older. You watch it and you go, I understand those emotions. It yeah. might be from a different decade, a different century, but I understand what Jim is going through in that movie or I understand what Cameron is going through in that movie, you know. And if they didn't feel genuine, then they wouldn't last. Definitely, yeah. Um, so I just wanted to kind of wrap up with our favourites. I think mine is Breakfast Club. You've mentioned that yeah. yours is Ferris. I think so, yeah. I mean, yeah. It's, it, for personal reasons, it's sort of the one that got me into the whole thing. But also, just looking at it now, I think it's a very adventurous, flamboyant, one-off kind of movie yeah. um, that, that people have tried to replicate. Um, you know, uh, do you remember that awful film, Van Wilder? Van yes. Wilder Party Liaison with Ryan yes. Reynolds. <laughs> yes, I remember it, speaking to Ryan Reynolds about that. And he was like, well, I was told to watch Ferris Bueller's Day Off before that. You know, um, and so uh, you Did know. Did you watch the right one? It, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think he watched it, but he just didn't take in any of the yeah. Um, but you know, that's still a reference point to so many people. Is there any that you would say are like? I don't want to use the word worst because I don't think we're dealing with bad films here. Yeah, but I would say my least favorite is Weird Science. Yeah, I I would say. I'd probably say 16 Candles, actually. Okay. And in a way, I, uh, what was great about 16 Candles is it gave a young woman a voice, you mm -hmm. know. And that was quite a rarity, actually, to have a, a female lead. Uh, again, you know, now we're used to it. It's Lady Bird or whatever, Little Women, you know, we see it yeah. all the time. But that was a rarity. So I don't want to do that down. But I think that the rest of it feels a little pedestrian. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, Weird Science is is not my thing but i think there's enough hughesian elements in it for me to enjoy the sci-fi stuff i'm less interested in yeah um and it's interesting that joel silver produced that joel silver of course went on to do the matrix movies mm. and many other things yeah. and you always wonder what his kind of input you know is the sci-fi element the the is that joel silver pushing that into it a little bit more than than john hughes because uh, you never really got this you never really got the sense from anything else that John Hughes was into sci-fi. I mean, I think that might be my issue with it, that it kind of sticks out a bit like a sore thumb. Yeah. That this is, you wouldn't have had that in any other films and it wouldn't necessarily fit in in any of the other, other films. I know. It's interesting. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah. I really appreciate this. Um, yeah, those two. Those two. Out of his teen films, I'd agree with you. Yeah. Oh my God, listen, listen, if someone wants to talk to me about John Hughes for half an hour, I'm more than happy. It's a, a pet project, so I'm very happy. Thank you.